to jump into the word. Props to the band. Thank you so much. Hey, we've been in a, a sermon series on the book of 1 John, and this is called Reborn and Raised. And what this is talking about, uh, what we've been trying to address is this, is that in the book of 1 John, there's some similarities. Uh, we live in a very multicultural uh uh, polytheistic world, and uh, we saw that at the Olympics. There you go, right there. You saw that. Uh, we see all of uh, our world and our society looking not only to create more margin, uh, but really trying to find truth, trying to find identity, trying to find a sense of security. And for those that are believers, for those that are following Jesus, it can become extremely difficult, let alone trying to date in the bay, let alone trying to remain married and happy, let alone try to have babies in the bay. It's really how do you live your life of, of seeing Jesus fully submersed in Jesus, fully the, the spirit of God embedded in your life and, and knowing without a shadow of a doubt that your faith is in him, that you can have a confidence. You know what John really begins to preach about, this is the same John that wrote the book of John, and John has like a little bit of a view of himself that is a, a little bit different. John always refers to him as himself, and he's like, man, John the beloved. He was like, man, I'm not just John, I was a John that Jesus really liked. All the mother fools, <laughs> Jesus really liked John. And I want to be that way. You know, if this is our first time meeting, you know, I've been a pastor for a number of years, 20-something years. And when we started the church, uh, it was all about creating a space for people to get close to Jesus. That, that was the, the, whole, the whole deal. It, it wasn't to, to make a name because I'm going to tell you this, church planting ain't the easiest thing to do. Some of you are like, man, I'm in a startup. A startup for Jesus with no money? Try that one out. There you go. Shark tank that idea. See what happens. But it was honestly just... To create a, a, a runway for people to experience the love of God. And, and we won't stop doing that. And what John is, is doing is this. I think John is, is holding a position that we all can hold. You could be Teresa the Beloved. You could be Gabby the Beloved. You could be uh, Jeffrey the Beloved. You could be Tyrone the Beloved. You could be Jerome. You could be Pablo. You could be, all, you could be the Beloved that there is a place that we can have in Christ. And when you have that place, there's a confidence that comes along with that place. That no matter what, whatever you see, whatever you go through... Your confidence is in God. See, we're no longer questioning. There's a place that we get in our relationship with Jesus. We're not questioning if we get out of, get out of hell free car. We don't serve God because hell is hot. And that's why we live in the Bay, because it's 73 most of the time. We serve God because he first loved us while we were still sinners. And there's a confidence that we can have. And so this morning, what I want to do, I got two working titles for it. The first one is this twist test, or the second one is don't get it twisted. Look at somebody with all the thug that you got in them and say, don't get it twisted. And if you're not familiar with Ebonics, what that means is this. Don't misinterpret who you messing with. Don't let the corduroys fool you. Don't let the suit and tie. Don't let the Zoom tag fool you. Don't get it twisted. This is who you're really messing with. And what John is wanting us to do is to not see that our doctrine becomes twisted. That we don't misinterpret what does it really mean to follow Christ. So I'm going to read a few verses of scripture and I want you to leave your politics aside. Because I'm going to say a few terms and you're going to try to plug a political figure in there. That ain't them. I'm going to just let you know. But John says this in 1 John chapter 4. He said, beloved, notice that when we know how God views us, we can look at others the way that God does. John looks at himself as the beloved. So then every time he addresses the church, he says, man, you are my beloved. You're the one that my heart belongs to, my heart goes for. He says, beloved, do not believe every spirit. But test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this, you know the spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses, number one, Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist. Everybody say Antichrist. See, there you go. That's what I wanted you to just leave out that political figure who you think it is right there and just put that to the side and let Jesus just mess your heart. He says this. The Antichrist, which you heard, was coming and now is in the world already. This was to almost 2,000 years ago. So the Antichrist, that which opposes the message, the teachings, that which undermines the truth of who Jesus is already in the earth. And now he says, little children, you are from God and have overcome them. For he who is in you is greater than he that is in this world. They are from the world. Therefore, they speak from the world, and the world listens to them. But we are from God. Whoever knows God listens to us. Whoever is not from God does not listen to us. By this way, we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. 
Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word today. And we ask, Lord, that you would unwind. Lord, you would, um, you would turn our hearts to you. Lord, whether it be trauma, whether it be pain, whether it be bad teaching, whether it be religion that we grew up in, Lord, whether it be the, the latest feed or the most recent stream that we saw, Lord, that has called us to twist the way that we view you and twist the way that we view ourselves. I pray, Lord, that today would, you would be a day where you would unpack our hearts, that we'd be able to see ourselves the way that you see us. And most importantly, Lord, that is so true. That, that's the center of it. But to see those we interact with in light of your word, in light of who you are. And then we ask this in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. I don't know if you ever have this conversation. You ever talk to somebody about the most recent thing that you watched? And when you guys go back and forth, you're kind of sharing like, oh, you, have you seen this? Like, that's most of the time. Like when you see your friends, you'll be like, hey, what you been watching? And you start having that dialogue. And then they start saying what they watch and you start sharing what they watch. And then do you ever get to that point where they share something they watch and you start looking at them differently? <laughs> you ever did that? Like you were like, oh, you watch this? I was like, wait, what are you watching? <laughs> 51 shades of what? What are you watching? What you doing? You know, I was thinking about this is a lot of times there's like this test that we take that we kind of figure out like where somebody is at, how, how crazy or where they are. Like, for example, no shame. I promise you, I'm not going to lead you astray. I'm not going to ask a question and then ridicule. But how many of you guys watch scary movies? Raise your hand. Like scary movies? No, just go ahead. Raise your hand. Be, be proud. You're weird. No, I'm just joking with you. I'm joking with you. Like, he lied, he lied. I'm just messing with you. I will say this about scary movies. The only thing I don't understand about scary movies is this. It's like your pain for someone to be scared. Like you're paying for fear. Like that's a weird thing. The last scary movie that I saw was The Ring and literally me and my friend saw that. I ain't never seen a scary movie outside of that. We was playing old Christian country music just to like change the environment. He went to the bathroom. I was waiting outside the door like, hey bro, you done in there? Cause these hallways look scary, man. But some of the things when it comes to movies, like when you get into the conscious of somebody, you're like, yo, they are twisted. Like some of the movies and the things that are out there, you're like, man, how did y'all think of that? You got midgets hanging from the ceiling with chainsaws. How did that happen? What's going on? And one of the things that we have to understand is this, is that when it comes to our own propensities, our own desires, our own subconscious, everybody's a little twisted. Everybody's got a little bend on them. Everybody's got a little nuance. Everybody's got something that has impacted or traumatized or kind of has attached to their imagination. And in the wrong place, in the wrong environment, we could all do some really grimy things. You don't have to create saw to be a little twisted. I know this about myself. If I am out of prayer for a long enough period of time, if I'm detached from community from a long period of time, if I push my wife away for a long period of time, I could be one of the most wicked people on the planet because we weren't made to live that way. And when we come into Christ, when we say our lives are now in Jesus, we have to understand that there is a process that is undergoing in our souls. That some of us, we grew up in a traumatized home. And so what happens because of that trauma, it's embedded in the way that we think, the way that we view. And then we come into church and people say, hey, man, you got to love God. And to love God means you got to serve. And then you begin to equate serving equals love. And that is not true. So then you start serving. And then you realize after serving for so long that you don't feel any closer to God. And then you're like, I'm done with the church. They only want me for my service. No, there was something deeper in your soul that was twisted that God never unpacked to let you know that he loves you right where you are. And it's not just religion, that it's a relationship that he's desiring. And this process that we all must undergo is to God for, to realign our hearts and to change the way we view and the way that we think. And so what John is doing is, is this. He's teaching the church to know that something is truly from God, to know that if something is twisted or something is manipulated or something that has come into their life, is this truly from God? Some of you thinking right now, is this boyfriend that you're sitting right next to, are they from God? No, they're not. I'm just joking. <laughs> is this girl from God? How do you know this is God? And John wants you to know very clearly that there's a spiritual thing that is taking place to truly reconcile if this is from God. You see, the big idea that I have for you this morning is this. We are not designed to live a life to be of intimidation, but to be in a place of authority to test everything, to verify its origin and application to our flourishing life in Christ. 
What I want to say in the most clearest way is, is this, is that if you are a follower of Christ, you, do no, you no longer have the luxury to just welcome anything and everything into your life. You don't. Now, if you're not a follower of Christ and you're like, man, I'm just figuring this thing out. Is this the right religion? I'm so glad that you're here. But at some point when you say, hey, man, I'm following Jesus, there must be a, le- a place where you're like, you know what? I only can allow things that are going to assist and support me in my relationship with God. And I don't mean you just kicking friends to the curb like deuces, Duke. You don't love God. That's not the way it works. But there's certain things because you understand. If I allow this into my life, this may lead me off course. And it doesn't always have to be the worst movie or the newest drug or the newest song. Sometimes it's thought patterns. Sometimes it's the way that we interpret in our viewpoint of life. Sometimes it's even our politics that can actually derail your relationship with God because these things can become idols. And what John is teaching us is this. He wants you to learn how to test so that we don't get twisted. The first thing that I want you to ask yourself this morning is this. Are you an influencer? Now, when I talk about influencer, what's the first thing that you think? You think of Instagram, you think duck lips, the whole deal, like influencer. That's not the point that I want to make. An influencer, what John is asking of is this, is the world influencing you or are you influencing the world? Are you in an environment in such a way that everything that comes at you, you're figuring a way, how do you synthesize? How do you add this to your life? Or is there a sense of awareness where you're like, you know what? I don't think I need to add that into my theology. I don't think I need to add that into my framework. I don't think I need to add that, that there's this sense of an awareness of what is happening in society. And are you influencing the world or is the world influencing you? You see what John says this, he says, beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. Now, when we first hear this, we have to ask ourselves, what is a spirit? Because how many people who light incense and you be playing NDRE, you know all the spirits. You spiritual. For some of us in the room, you got crystals and, and kittens. I don't know about that, but God will work. But what he's saying is, is this. There are spiritual spirits. There are unseen forces that influence the systems of our world. That's what he's saying. There are unseen forces that manipulate, that tweak and taint the unseen for unseen of the systems of this world. So there's spirits. Like I was thinking about this. There's a new agey spirit, right? It's just kind of this subtle cultural thing that kind of permeates society. That's a spiritual thing. There's also this new spirit that's playing over the world, where it's just a spirit of rebellion. Like, I'm going to be me, a spirit of individualism. That's your spirit. you just an individual. You shopping at the same H&M I'm shopping at. I don't know how you an individual. You shopping on Amazon. You that. There's a sleepy spirit. You know what I'm saying? How many guys got hit with the sleepy spirit? You're like, this morning, I got that sleepy spirit. What he's saying is, is this. There are unseen forces that are constantly interacting and working with. And everything is spiritual. But everything is spiritual is not from God. So he has to, he's, what he's wanting us to understand is, is this. Everything is spiritual. There's a spiritual connotation. There's an unseen battle that is happening. But we don't just are led by the spirits of this world, the unseen forces that manipulate the systems of this world. We have the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is separate and brings distinction to the life of the believer. It is the essence. It is the nature. It is knowing who God is. I'll give you an example, and it's not the best example, so don't go to, like, the forum and be like, Pastor Jules has bad theology. But it's this. The spirit works this way. I could scream right now to my kids, Viviana, blah, 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 go do this. (laughs) There's that Siri spirit, too. There you go. (laughs) Thank you. I appreciate that. That's awesome. Man, he, he didn't brought up services and all kinds of stuff. But I could call up to my daughter right now, and I can say, hey, Viviana, go do this. And she would not only recognize the voice, but she would know if it's truly me about what I'm asking of her. Why? Because we have walked in such a way that she knows my nature. She knows my way of thinking, my philosophy. She would know this is something that my dad would do. This is something that my dad would co-sign. And that's how the Holy Spirit works, by not only familiarity, but he begins to help us model and shape our broken nature into the new nature of God. There's a new force that's working with us. And when we look at what the teaching of John is, is what John is teaching us is how to test those things that we come in contact with. What John is modeling for us is this, is that there's going to be things that come and bombard us spiritually 
and we have to make sure that we are aware. Now, back in the day, and how many of my saints, you've been in here, you've been serving God for 30 plus years, make a hallelujah. My saints have been in there for 30 plus years. Raise your, some of the people were afraid. Some of them were like, no. Who've been serving God for 40 years? Raise your hand. There you go. Hallelujah all the way in the back. That's, a, that's how you know you've been serving God, when that hallelujah is strong. But back in the day, when it came to serving God, everything was looked at as evil. At some point in church, you couldn't dance. No goody mob. You don't dance no more. There was no chance. There was no dancing. When you, back in the day, if you were to love God, you don't go to the movies. You best not go into that theater. That's devil. That's devil worship in that theater. Now we got new Christians, right? You go to the movies. <laughs> you can still love God. Because there was a level of intimidation that people were so afraid of failing God that they counted everything as evil in hope of being holy. Now, this new generation is this. I could be holy and live like hell. I don't think that's where we were going with that one. I could have all of God and all of me. No, you got to die. But what is beautiful, what is redemptive is understanding this. Everything that we experience, all the good that we have in this earth may not always be directly from God, but can be redeemed for God. Now, let me give you an example. I'm going to give a quote here and this quote, and I don't have enough time to unpack it, but I'm just going to give you this. Now, this quote is from Martin Luther. Now, I'm Martin Luther King. This is Martin Luther. You got to know the difference. Martin Luther, <laughs> like that's probably where Martin Luther King got his name from. And guess what? He is white. <laughs> Y'all didn't know that. But Martin Luther was a preacher. He was a theologian. And what Martin Luther was doing is as he began to talk about reformation in the Catholic church, he began to nail on the church's wall how the church needed to be reformed. Because there was such exclusivity that people were like, you can only be holy if you look like that. And anything outside of that was, of God, was, of, was not of the Lord. And Martin Luther began to write reformation of the church. But this is what Martin Luther, what he said, and this is super interesting. And the reason why I'm wanting to bring this up is because I'm wanting to understand that everything that we encounter is not always evil, but good things that we have can be used for evil. Let me just, Martin Luther says this, whoever drinks beer, all the IPA fans, they, they can secretly say amen. He says this, whoever drinks beer, he is quick to sleep. Whoever sleeps, <laughs> all the beer drinkers are like, mm -hmm, yeah, that's right. All that hopping. <laughs> you ain't hopping, you sleeping. He says this, whoever sleeps long does not sin. <laughs> yeah, that's true. And whoever does not sin enters heaven. Thus, let us drink beer. <laughs> now, everybody going to leave here and be like, Margarita! Put some salt on it. That's not what I'm saying. That's not what I'm saying. And all those that have been serving God for 50 years are like, this Negro going to hell. Who is he teaching? <laughs> the point that I'm making is, is this. Everything that is on earth, God created it and has a purpose. Now, people, even good things that God can create it, can be abused by humans. And when broken humans get God things, they use it for their own selfish gain. So what Martin is saying is this. Martin, what he is saying in this moment is that this is something that through the ingenuity of humanity, partnering with God, this is something that can be good and can be used. Now, it can be used to silence the brokenness of your soul. It can be used as a cheap artificial tool to get over a girlfriend that left you. It can be used to drown out your depression. Or could it be used to align your heart with God? Now, what, Mar what, what Martin is causing, just what John is doing is, is this. It's to have such a level of maturity and growth in your faith that anything that is introduced into your life, you're looking for its redemptive potential. Does this draw me closer to God or does this pull me away? That's why there's freedom in Christ, because for some of us in this room, you probably can never drink a beer for the rest of your life. Because when you drink, it leads you to alcoholism. 
Because when you drink, it causes you to fall short. It causes you to be broken. It causes you to go into a deep place. And so you must refrain. And for others in this room, you may have the freedom to be able to drink. Now, here's my thing. I'm not co-signing on, other, on either of them. But what I am saying is, is this. And what John is saying, every spirit, everything that you encounter, does it assist you in your relationship with Christ? Or is it anti-Christ? Does it actually deteriorate? Some of you, you can't watch movies past 10 o'clock. Why? Because your imagination get wild. My brother's shaking. Yeah, he's like, I'm with you too. Certain things I just can't do. Why? Because it doesn't assist. It actually does the opposite for me. You see, what John begins to say is, is this, is that when we encounter spiritual things, we have to test the origin. Does this come from Jesus? And he says, this is how you know if something actually comes from Christ, if this is a spiritual thing. When it comes to our politics, are these politicians actually promoting Jesus? Are they actually following God? If this teacher, is they following God? How do you know that something is oriented to the life of Jesus? Number one, they are, un they are undeniable in their understanding that Jesus came in the form of a human man and died a sinner's death, and is truly God. He's saying not only the understanding that Jesus was fully God on the earth, but also where do they put Jesus in the hierarchy of their life? So let me be honest with you. Here's a little bit of my politics right now. I don't care about Kamala. Now, one of the things I can say is, is this. It is amazing that America has got to the place to be able to honor an African-American woman that has the opportunity to become president. I can see the redemptive part in that. I don't really like Trump. Not a big fan. Actually, I don't really like politics at all. Never have. I'm still voting for Jesus to be president. <laughs> but the point that I'm making is, is this. We have to test everything that is in the spirit of leadership over our lives. And not only just looking at policy, but we have to recognize there is no person on this earth that is going to accurately depict God other than Jesus. You got to test everything. And not everything that you allow in your life is actually helping you and assisting you in your relationship with Christ. You know what little kids do? They put everything in their mouth. A sign of spiritual immaturity is a refusal to deny yourself of certain privileges and pleasures because you know it's counterintuitive to your relationship with him. You know what a child does? Why are you putting that penny in your mouth, baby? You know what a child does? Why are you putting that? Why? Why? They have no ability to discern what is good and what is evil, so all is acceptable. That is a number one indicator of spiritual immaturity, to be open to every spirit and have no regard or sanctity for saying, Jesus, you truly are at the helm of my life. You see, the reason why the Olympics was so bad is not just because there was drag queens that were on stage, and I didn't even watch it. I just saw all the feeds. I was like, dang, this is crazy. RuPaul is out there. He is killing the game. <laughs> you know what it was so bad was is this. is because there was no sense of sanctity that there are some things that just belong to God. And that spirit has permeated our society. Man, Siri, you are killing me, bro. <laughs> that spirit has permeated our society. And before we throw rocks at the rings, has that same spirit permeated your life? Is there a sense of sanctity that this belongs to God? Does sex belong to God? Does your marriage belong to God? Does money belong to God? Or have the spirits of this world twisted and tweaked your doctrinal landscape. What John is teaching us, very quickly, John is teaching us how to test how something has been twisted in our lives. I'm going to read a couple of verses of scripture and, and, and then we'll change gears. It says this, they, he, or who teach twisted doctrine are of the world and belong to it. Therefore, they speak from the viewpoint of the world with its immoral freedom and baseless theories, demanding compliance without their opinions and ridiculing the values of the upright. And the gullible people of the world listen closely and pay attention to them. And what John begins to go on and tell us is this, is that there is an antichrist spirit that permeates our society and of the world. It just does. And we see that. 
And as people of the light, we have to make sure that when we see twisted things, they don't twist us. Now, the last couple of years, my wife has been telling me I need to smell better. Anybody got to have people in your life that tell you you need to smell better? <laughs> you need those friends. It ain't like I've been funky. Here's the, here's the thing. You can't be big and funky. You got to choose one. <laughs> that's, just, that's doctrine right there. Doctrine according to Jules. You could choose one. You be big, but you can't be big and funky. It just look bad for the rest of us, so choose one. So I chose to be big, not going to be funky. So the point is, is my wife was like, hey, you need to try some of these smell goods. And so she took me to some high-end places, and I was like, oh, what, what you spending? This is crazy. And you look at those bottles, you're like, can I get the sample? <laughs> But I didn't know this, but there's a whole philosophy called dupes out there. Now, for some of y'all nodding your head, y'all know about the dupe, but the others, y'all in the dark. Now, what a dupe is, is this. It's a duplicate of something of high value. So guess what? You like them Lulus? You can get the boo-boos. <laughs> it's, it's got similar stretch to it, but you stretch too much, they... <laughs> they gong-gongs. <laughs> it's a dupe. It looks similar in appearance, but it's lacking the name and the branding or an, an important component. So for me, my wife is showing me all these smell goods, but I'm like, you know what? What a dupe set. What a, what a, what a, what a dupe at. It's $300. The dupe not, though. The dupe is 30 But one of the things that I learned, so I get my dupes, and I'm like, yo, I'm expanding my little spritz spritz collection, you know? But it don't last long. <laughs> the dupe don't, the dupe dupe me. It don't last long. That spritz spritz go outside. I'm like, I gotta go back inside and spritz spritz again. And that's how false theology works. It creates the appearance that it's very similar, but there are some missing factors and it's not connected to eternity. And what John is saying is, is this, he does not want your relationship with God to be a duplicate and unauthentic in its understanding to be able to discern, is this actually from the maker? Or did someone get their hands on it, twist it and manipulate it, and now it's a part of your life? He's saying you have theologically become duped. And here's the crazy thing. Every dupe may not cost you up front, but it will cost you more at some point. Man, just to keep these bottles going in rotation, I got to buy 10 bottles. It cost me the same amount of money. Ben, you can come up. What John is saying is, is this, is that the world always wants to take what is from God, twist it a little bit, so it seems like it is still from him. And what he's saying is, is this, in your maturity, in your familiarity with God, can you recognize a dupe that's not from God? You see, I want to end with this note. Like I started this sermon, is that we're all a little twisted. There's all a little brokenness in all of us. And so when we come to God, there's this complexity of, of, of our pain and our trauma, sin, certain habits that we have that need to be renewed and restored. And I love this because in Psalms, I believe, I got to put those glasses back on. I was trying to be cute with the glasses off. But David says this in Psalms 51. David goes on and he says, I was born in iniquity. I was born with this bent propensity towards sin. I was twisted in my understanding, twisted in the way that I perceived God, twisted in how I viewed love, twisted in, in how I viewed certain substances that literally would take me apart. I was born in iniquity. He says, I was created in that. And most people want to just stay right there in their iniquity, in that twisted. The Greek word means to be lawless in a particular area, to push away the, the authority of God in our lives. David says, I was born this way. And what John is saying is, is this. When we come to Christ, there is an untwisting that takes place that brings our souls back into its redemptive state. 
He's saying in, in order for us to experience true justice and be able to express true justice is to know Jesus to where the untwisting of our souls have taken place and we will no longer settle for a dupe. We must have the real thing. You know, I was thinking in my life, there have been multiple areas where I know because of shame, brokenness, growing up in, in aspects of my home, things that have happened to me that shouldn't have happened to me, I have every excuse to remain in a state of brokenness. I have every excuse to be in a place of shame and ridicule. But the more that I've been in Christ, the more that I allow Christ to renew my mind, the more that I allow God's word to penetrate the broken areas of my soul and of my heart, it brings renewal to my thoughts. And then I began to live like Jesus. And the more that I'm close with Jesus, when anything that is not of Jesus, when things are anti-Jesus, when things are pulling away from my marriage, I recognize that's a fake alternative. And I have to make a decision. Is this gonna assist or is this gonna repel? in my relationship with God.